Dr. Allen once again. So this is going to be a fun one. You guys are really going to like this. I had a guest on, and as you guys know me, I've never had a guest on my program, so this is the first one. But I felt his message was so important that you had to hear it directly from him. Now, no matter how well I've been trying to explain this for the last 20 years, telling people you cannot outrun your diet. No matter how much cardio you do or how much weightlifting you do, you cannot outrun your diet. So it's a very, very important message. I have with me on today Sal Stefano. He's one of the co-founders of Mind Pump Media Podcast, the number one health and fitness podcast in all of the land. You can find it wherever you listen to podcasts. Now, he's coming out with a book called The Resistance Training Revolution, um, and he's going through why resistance training needs to be included in your activity and should come before cardio. Sure, cardio is good for your health, and as a cardiologist, it's, it's really good for you. It reduces mortality and improves your blood sugar, insulin sensitivity, cholesterol, hypertension, all of that, but... It's not the most efficient way to lose fat. And I've been talking about this forever. It's nice to have a guest on who also uh, agrees. We go over the research studies showing that excessive cardio can actually shorten your lifespan and even reduce mortality. Um, and then we have a little bit of fun. Um, I present to him some cardiac patients. I say, let's say you're Dr. Sal. I'm the cardiologist. Here's patient number one. What would you do in this scenario? And then I gave him a little bit harder patient, which I know is, is, is definitely more complicated and we go through the scenarios of what we would do with this patient. Um, so it's a really fun episode. Um, you can buy his book, click on the links below. I'm not gonna waste too much time without any more waiting. Here is the interview with Sal Stefano. Welcome to the program. Um, this is Dr. Allo. Uh, I'm based out of Toledo, Ohio. This, today we have with us Sal Stefano, one of the co-founders of Mind Pump uh, media, the number one fitness podcast on the internet. I'm pretty excited to have him on because I've been lecturing on weight loss, uh, diet and exercise for over 20 years. Um, and it's hard to be the only person trying to get this point across that you cannot outlift or outrun, uh, your diet. I've been talking about exercise for years, trying to, to mainly to physicians, you know, a lot of like most of the lectures I gave, and I'll tell you that most of my audience uh, are physicians. Um, I'm trying to get the point across that you cannot always be telling your patients diet and exercise. Um, most of my patients, at least, can't even get out of a chair sometimes. So telling them that they have to exercise uh, to lose weight is sometimes puts puts up like a barrier uh, where they can't even you know they can't even imagine getting up out of a chair or walking to the bathroom. How on earth am I supposed to lose weight if that's what my doctor is always telling me? Um, I know you have a book coming out, and your staff was gracious enough to send it to me. Um, but I had already ordered it, which is which is pretty exciting. So I'm getting a hardcover sometime at the end of May. Um, but you have a book called the the uh, Resistance Training Revolution. Yes. So yes. talk to me about that first of all. Why is resistance training uh, a revolution? Oh yeah. So um, uh, first, thanks for having me on your show. I really appreciate it. So I, I, before I talk about that, I'd like to comment on what you just said. Uh, I think you said it uh, perfectly trying to approach a weight loss through a, I'm going to move more and burn more calories approach is a failing approach. Um, it's very, very difficult to burn calories, very, very easy to eat calories. Uh, so if we don't ha have people work with nutrition in a, in a sustainable way, um, trying to work it off is, uh, it's, a, it's a losing battle. And the body actually adapts quite well to burning calories to, to the point where it starts to become more efficient. In fact, there's studies that show that uh, you know, very active populations, when they do some pretty sophisticated testing, they find they don't even burn that many more calories than the average uh, sedentary person, which I'll get into uh, here in just a second. Um, the, the resistance training revolution really is about the, the single best form of exercise that most people um, should engage in, or at least the one form of exercise that they should pick if they could only pick one form of exercise. Now I say this from a from a uh, personal trainer who's worked with uh, you know hundreds of people personally, thousands of people by proxy, managed gyms, and I've done this for over over two and a half decades. I've done this for a very very long time. Um, I've trained lots of uh, medical professionals uh, in that period as well. So my experience um, is is what I'm speaking to, um, and it and it, and it kind of goes like this. Um, when you when you look at uh, exercise as an approach to improving your health, you have to consider the the context of modern life, and you have to consider the behaviors of the average person. Most people, most people will not exercise every single day 
for the rest of their life. It's just not going to happen. Um, there's a lot of reasons for this. Um, part of it is, you know, call it what you will, discipline, motivation. Another part of it is, um, you know, you have to structure your, your, your day to, to increase activity or to exercise. We don't active in our normal day. And so we have to look at it that way. We have to say, okay, the average person, in my experience, if I do a really good job, I can get the average person to do two or three days a week of, of exercise um, on a long-term basis. And again, I'm looking at this from a, a long-term basis. The second part of this is uh, you want to look at exercise from a different perspective. The, the perspective we've, we've been looking at exercise for a long time is burning calories. Movement burns calories. Okay. Uh, if we burn more calories than we're taking in, then we'll lose weight and that'll solve uh, the obesity uh, epidemic. The problem with that is uh, it takes a lot of work to burn a lot of calories. Um, in fact, an hour of cardiovascular activity might burn you about 400 calories if you're lucky. Um, and, and by the way, those cardio machines all lie to you. So if you, if you have a treadmill at home and it says you burned 800 calories, don't believe it. Most people burn three to 400 calories in an hour of uh, vigorous cardiovascular activity, which is the highest calorie burn form of exercise. Um, so, and, and you also have to do it every day in order to reap some of those calorie burning benefits. Uh, what I'm telling people to do is to stop looking at exercise as a let's burn calories, but rather let's look at the side effects of the form of exercise that we choose. Let's look at the adaptations that that form of exercise triggers uh, in the body. Okay. When you look at things from those perspectives, what you find is that resistance training is superior form of exercise for modern life uh, because, number one, it doesn't require as much time to reap uh, the benefits. Now, it doesn't burn as many calories as cardiovascular activity uh, in terms of a, you know, how much time you, if you do an hour of resistance training versus an hour of cardio. However, resistance training is the only form of exercise that teaches the body to burn more calories on its own. It's the only form of exercise that has a positive, uh, you know, effect on the metabolism. And this is through the, the muscle building, strength boosting effect of resistance training. So on the one hand, you could try to burn calories manually, or on the other hand, you could teach your body to burn more calories on its own and potentially increase your metabolism by two, three, four hundred calories a day. I've even had clients boost their metabolisms uh, much more than that. Um, and, you know, 300 more calories a day or 400 more calories a day, every single day, just doing your normal daily stuff, not having to try to burn it yourself. But that has a huge impact uh, over, over time. Um, muscle is also very protective. Uh, it increases or improves insulin sensitivity. Um, it's protective against illness. If you're sick, having more muscle makes a big difference. Um, it also uh, helps combat um, some of our chronic health issues like dementia and Alzheimer's. In fact, resistance training was shown to be one of the more superior forms of exercise for uh, preventing the, the progression of Alzheimer's. And maybe even in one study, they even suggested that it might even uh, reverse it a little bit, probably again, due to the, uh, the insulin sensitizing effects. This is what they speculated. Um, uh, so it's a great form of exercise. And the problem, the reason why this is a revolution is because resistance training has been stereotyped and stigmatized, right? So when we think of resistance training, if I say lift weights, the average person thinks of a bodybuilder, uh, you know, somebody with big bulging muscles. Right, uh, women especially. Especially women, right? So, uh, but men too, you know, if, if, if you're as a doctor, if you're talking to your 55 year old male client whose blood lipids don't look so good, blood pressure maybe a little high, needs to lose a little weight and you say to him, you know, why don't you try lifting weights twice a week? They're going to probably respond and say, oh, no, no, I don't want to get big. I just want to get more healthy. Um, so it's this stereotype that's just been promoted by the extreme, you know, athletes that, that perform resistance training and by the media. Whenever we see somebody lifting weights in media and movies, uh, of course, it's, it's someone like Arnold Schwarzenegger or, or Sylvester Stallone. But the truth couldn't be further from that. Uh, resistance training produces a very lean, strong, sculpted uh, physique. Um, in men, it reliably raises testosterone. No form of exercise has been shown to reliably do this. In women, it can it uh, oftentimes will balance uh, progesterone and estrogen in women, whereas sometimes other forms of exercise can cause uh, imbalances. And it's also the only form of exercise that is so customizable 
that I could do it with anybody. In fact, it's the primary form of exercise that physical therapists will use when treating, you know, treating people or, or training people who've had lots of injury. <clears throat> so the goal of the book really is to get people to understand that, to change the perspective of resistance training. And I'm glad you have a, uh, an audience of, of physicians because ultimately what I would love is when doctors recommend exercise that they consider resistance training as the first form and not the other forms of exercise, which we can get into later um, in terms of why they are inferior and in many cases uh, might even cause uh, problems for people. Right. So the, the biggest problem is the American Heart Association has always been recommending that you've got to get about 150 minutes of activity uh, per week. Now, most people interpret that activity as aerobics. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I'm giving this talk, I'm always trying to explain to physicians and my audiences and even patients sometimes that, that it's not, you know, you can do cardio. Um, but obviously, like you're saying, the uh, effects of resistance training last much longer, long after you've resistance trained, which you may burn 150, maybe 200 calories. Um, because you've built muscle, your basic metabolic rate goes up over time. And even when you're doing just normal stuff at home, uh, you're burning uh, more calories. So I always try, I always tell people, look, I'm a cardiologist. I'm not anti-cardio. Like I, the last thing I want is for people to go home and say, well, my cardiologist told me not to do any cardio. Um, cardio in and of itself is obviously very protective. It reduces cardiovascular mortality, uh, reduces your blood pressure, systolic and diastolic, improves your diabetes, hypertension, cholesterol, all that stuff. But it's just not a very good way to lose weight. Um, and I've been trying to get that point across for a very long time. Um, I hope I've been as eloquent as you are, but um, yeah, it's, 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 it, yeah, I'd love to ask you, um, sure. this, you're an expert in the field of heart health. Um, uh, I've seen some more and, and one of the other problems with resistance training is it hasn't been nearly as studied as cardiovascular exercise for health. Right. The True. studies on resistance training are usually uh, for performance. Uh, so they just don't do a lot of studies. But there are some recent studies that show that it's uh, as effective uh, in many cases as cardiovascular activity for, uh, for health of the cardiovascular system, um, especially when done appropriately. Um, right. And I'd, lo I'd love your opinion on that. Yeah, so, so some of the studies you actually cited in your book, that Mayo Clinic uh, study where they looked at calcium score. And if, if for people who don't know, calcium score is when they do a CT scan of your heart and they see how much calcium is already built up uh, in your arteries. Um, it was it was a huge it was a huge population it was like 3,200 uh, patients and I know you mentioned it in your book as well. They found um, that people did aerobic training three times more than what's recommended. Um, actually, had a 27% increase in their calcium scores, so they had 27% more calcium burden in their coronary arteries, which eventually leads to atherosclerosis, heart attack, strokes, and all of that. Um, there was a study done. I don't think you had this one in there, but after somebody's had a heart attack or stent or open heart surgery, we enroll them in something called cardiac rehab. It's an exercise program. They put the EKG leads on you and they have you get on a bike and they increase your heart rate because all the bad stuff that happens after a heart attack or stroke um, or open heart surgery usually happens when your heart rate is high. You can go into a deadly heart rhythm. Um, so we put you on the EKG leads and make you do this program for three months. They recently studied what would happen if we added resistance uh, training to it. Uh, because for the most part, it was just aerobic uh, training. So they found um, that when you added resistance training, first of all, it was just as safe. People, you know, they, they, they used to think that you shouldn't do it because it's not as safe. Um, but they found, first of all, it's just as safe. The amount of people that dropped out of the program was similar, um, whether it was aerobic or you added the, the group that had aerobic and resistance. Um, but it found that their strength went up, their functionality went up, their mobility uh, went up, their body composition improved. All of that is something that you did not get with the aerobic training alone group. Um, so it was really uh, important to demonstrate that even in cardiac patients who've had the worst cardiac uh, things you could, you could possibly imagine, that they actually improve um, with this. So definitely it helps, and there's lots of studies on it. Um, I know you also talk about the Copenhagen study um, in your book, the Copenhagen Heart Study. Joggers that did intense jogging um, actually did worse. They had a higher chance of dying early. Um, it was three times higher than people who just lightly jogged. And then people who did it even more, um, you know, way more intense, like seven, oh, seven miles an hour uh, speed, at least over four hours a week, had a nine times higher chance uh, of dying early. So that in and of itself also shows you that um, cardio is not also safe. A lot of people think, oh, I'll just start running. 
you know, you're 30 years old, like most of my patients, they're 30, sometimes up to 70, 80 years old, maybe more. They've been couch potatoes for the longest time, and now they suddenly want to start running. That's not safe. That that is dangerous. I know you guys talk about that all the time. Tell me, tell me, like the kind of injuries or what what you've seen with that. Yeah, there's a there's a huge misconception w- uh, with cardiovascular exercise that it's because one of the main reasons I would say besides the media and medical push, uh, one of the reasons why resist why cardiovascular activity or running in particular is so popular is because it's perceived as simple. Oh, I just put on a pair of running shoes and I go run. Running is a very complex, although it's a, it's a fundamental foundational uh, human movement. I mean, we were, we evolved to run. Um, if you don't run all the time, you totally lose that skill. So it's a very technical form of, uh, of activity, of motion. So most people, when they decide at 35 to put on some running shoes or maybe older and, hey, I'm going to go lose some weight, they haven't been running on a regular basis for, for years, decades, or maybe ever. And then they just go run. And so what they do is they end up, uh, they have terrible biomechanics. And whenever you train a, a movement pattern, whether it's good or bad, you strengthen and solidify that movement pattern. So you, you run terribly and you end up running harder terribly and you end up developing these tel- terrible movement patterns that stress the joints in ways that are not uh, beneficial. And so you see, in fact, if you look at the injuries uh, that result from exercise, res- uh, cardio- running in particular, is near the top. Lots of right. knee injuries, hip injuries, lots of ankle uh, issues. That's the number one sports medicine. All my friends in sports medicine say the number one injury and why people come in is because they decided to pick up running. Right. And it's not because running uh, per se is is bad for the joints. Again, we evolved to run. In fact, if, if you go and look at modern hunter-gatherers, uh, they, they run their entire lives and almost never suffer from some of the same issues. The problem is, is that it's very complex uh, biomechanically. And if you've never done it before, what you need to do is you need to treat running like a skill and go and practice it. Nobody does this, right? So when they go run, they go run to exhaustion, which by the way, when you're practicing a skill and trying to perfect your technique, the worst possible thing you could do is do it to exhaustion because you're, when you're tired, your body reverts towards its, uh, its perf- the bio- whatever movement pattern it's used to. So if you, if you, if you only ever walk, for example, in high heels and you train like that all the time, uh, you're get good at walking in heels and you'll be bad walking without heels. Um, but you're obviously stressing the body in ways it's not supposed to be stressed. So this is what happens uh, a lot of times with running. Now this is true with resistance training as well. The difference is resistance training, at least people perceive it as more of a skill-based form of exercise. Um, but I do stress in the book to treat resistance training. And for that matter, any form of exercise, as a skill rather than valuing it for the fatigue that you get. You know, if you go out and you exercise, let's say you go to the gym and you do resistance training and you treat it like practice rather than I'm going in here to get sore and tired and sweaty, you'll get far better results, uh, both in the short term and the long term, because you're perfecting a technique and skill and, and that'll pay you dividends that far surpass what poor technique well, and again, if you get good at poor technique, it's it really hard uh, to reverse out of that. So, you know, that's one of the big things that you find with, uh, with, with, with running in particular, but cardiovascular is people think, oh, I'll just go do it. It's so easy. I, resistance training is so complex. Now, the truth is they're all complex, but uh, resistance training is not nearly as complex as people think. Really, for the average person, if you perfect and practice you know, five exercises, uh, you know, or six exercises, which I could name, um, you'll be, you'll do tremendous. You'll do uh, tremendously. You do great. But the results of that, of course, will be a much stronger, more stable body with a faster uh, metabolism. And, you know, speaking to strength, a lot of our problems, especially with our aging population is the result of just being weak. Um, Poor mobility is often due to uh, weakness you know, it's, uh, I, I trained a lot of doctors and I remember uh, a saying that one of them told me, which is, uh, you, uh, break your hip and die of pneumonia. Uh, you know, it's like, you, you know, when you're, you know, when you're frail and you break a bone, uh, it's, it's, it, you don't have a lot of strength and muscle to support you. And it's a very, very fast, uh, decline. Um, there are also studies that show that a simple strength test, which I think this is absolutely brilliant, like squeezing, you know, uh, a, a dynamometer, I think I'm saying that right. Dino, I'm, it's a device that measures your squeeze strength. 
um, that can predict all cause mortality relatively accurately for, uh, you know, when you compare it to other single tests or a get off the ground test, right? Can you get off of the ground without grabbing onto something? So, and of, of course, we're so inactive in modern societies. We're just very weak. You know, osteopenia affecting women in their 30s, which is insane. Resistance training, uh, it's, it directly combats all that uh, differently or, or more effectively than almost anything else. Yeah, definitely true. And, and I, a lot of my patients say, well, doc, I, I can barely get out of a chair. How do you expect me to, to do anything? Tell them, well, keep practicing getting out of a chair. I mean, that's the first step. If you can barely get up the first time, the next two or three times, it'll get easier and easier. Start trying to pick things up off the floor. I mean, these are obviously older, uh, more sickly patients, but that's a good start. Dr. Um, Allo, I, I worked with a lot of people in advanced age. Right. Let me tell you, uh, the, the, the benefits that they got from resistance training were nothing short of miraculous. Um, and it's, um, it, it, and you, 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 you hit the nail on the head. Uh, it's so customized. Resistance training is essentially using resistance, which can be your body. It could be a resistance band. Of course, it could be a dumbbell or a barbell or a machine in a way to elicit strength and muscle gains. But it must be appropriate. Okay, so if I have a client, I'll give you an example. And I, uh, I'll, one of my clients, uh, you know, was uh, she was 85 when I first had her. Uh, very, very poor condition. Um, she hadn't exercised in a very, very, very long time. And one of our exercises consisted of her trying to straighten her arm up over her head. I mean, the resistance of her arm and her lack of mobility and trying to increase that range of motion, just get it a little straighter each time. That was all we needed to do to strengthen her shoulders and upper back, right? Um, when we got her to the point to where she could sit up or stand up from a bench, um, and I had to modify this, I would put pads up so she didn't have to sit down very low. That was her lower body exercise. We would slowly sit down with control and stand up and we would start with one repetition and rest for a while and eventually we got her to doing 15 of those. But the, the results were miraculous. You know, this same woman, uh, I, this was uh, probably about eight months into training her. She and by the way, I trained 500 pounds. Uh, no, yeah, no. I trained her um, once a week uh, and then eventually twice a week. And th again, uh, if you look at the literature, this you get significant strength gains with even one day a week of resistance training and the results stick much longer. You, you can actually not lift weights or do resistance training for weeks and maintain quite a bit of strength. But she came in to see, I was training another client, wasn't even her day. And she walks in through my front door, just excited. And I said, Kim, what's, why are you here? And she goes, I closed the trunk of my SUV by myself for the first time in years. She always had to have, you know, the, uh, somebody come in and help her. She's like, I haven't been able to do that in years. And it was, she was stronger and she felt much more secure. No, that that's awesome. The other thing that they've found in studies, which I think you, you know, I'm sure you know this already, but anybody who picks up a running program or some type of aerobic program, and there's lots of meta analysis, they show that um, they do lose some weight first in the beginning, the first two to three months, they will lose weight. And we've all had friends that have done this. They start running You're like, Oh, dude, you know, you look amazing. You've lost 10, 15 pounds. What are you doing? It's like, Oh, you know, I started running with my wife or whatever. But then you start looking at them long term, six, seven, eight, nine months out, they've regained all that weight back and put on weight. So, you know, running and aerobic training is not something um, like you said, your body can adapt, you know, the whole metabolic adaptation thing. Your body will increase your appetite. It'll do all kinds of things to try to get you back and readapts to that. So most people, when they start something new and it's a new stimulus or a new program, whatever is even weightlifting, um, they'll lose some weight up front. But if they're not controlling their calories or their diet isn't right, um, definitely you just put that all back. I'm sure you've seen that. Yes, I have. And, and here's what you want to consider. And I said early on in the, in the podcast, you want to look at the adaptations at the exercise, it's really what you want to look at. Forget the calorie burn and what's happening during the workout. How does it get the body to adapt? When you do lots of cardiovascular activity, what you're asking your body to do is to, be, to gain lots of endurance, to gain more stamina and endurance. Okay. Now, if you're an athlete and you need endurance and stamina, that's great. If you're the average person, Maybe you don't need that much endurance, but why, what, what, what other adaptations does this end up causing? Well, here's what ends up happening because cardiovascular activity burns a lot of calories during activity and doesn't require a lot of strength. It actually pairs muscle down. What you'll find in studies is that cardiovascular activity plus diet results in about half muscle loss and half fat loss. If you lose 10 pounds, five is muscle, five is fat. Now you got a slower metabolism, by the way. So now you have to eat even less 
to cause more fat loss. And this just makes sense. I mean, if, if you want to imagine, uh, you know, a super advanced AI car that advanced, that, that adapts to the way you drive, if you drove it slow for long distances, it would adapt and turn into a, like a, you know, a hybrid one cylinder engine that burns very, very little gas. And it doesn't need to be very powerful because you're not asking it to, you know, to have a lot of speed, right? On the, on the opposite end, if you are doing, you know, quarter mile races constantly with this car, it would build a very big engine that burns a lot of gas um, in order to perform that. So resistance training doesn't do that, right? Resistance training, what you're telling the body is, I need more strength. I need to get stronger. Well, bigger muscles contract harder. So now you build more muscle and you get stronger. Oh, and by the way, bigger muscles burn more calories. So cardiovascular activity over time slows down the metabolism, results in less muscle. Resistance training over time speeds up the metabolism from the increased strength in muscle. So what it looks like, and by the way, of course, both, uh, both scenarios, you still want to watch your nutrition. But in, in, in both scenarios, here's what it looks like when you see the weight loss. People who rely on lots of cardio, they lose very weight very quickly, and then it's a very hard plateau. People who use resistance training start off much slower, but then they get a snowball effect. And over time, the weight loss happens faster and faster and faster and becomes much easier uh, to maintain. And this just isn't being communicated uh, to the average person. No, totally, totally agree with that. Um, the, the, the question people come up, and, and I'm sure they've asked you this question, they say, well, studies don't show that um, your basic metabolic rate goes up that much from adding one pound of muscle. I mean, you've seen the studies. Sometimes yeah, it says it only goes up by six to eight calories. And then some of them say, well, maybe up to 80 calories or 50 or 60 calories. So when you tell someone, if you just put on five pounds of muscle, you could technically burn an additional 200 calories a day just sitting there or not, or you'd lose weight eating the same amount. Um, so how do you reconcile that? How do you explain to people, your clients or patients that look, it may, the studies when they measure these things might not show a huge amount of extra calorie burn from just one pound of muscle, but over time it adds up. So what do you, what do you say to people? So two things. Uh, number one, if you, if you burned 50, just 50 more calories a day, do the math over a year and you could see, in fact, when people gain weight, they average, you know, seven, eight pounds a year. That's like, that's like an, a, like a cookie a day or, or less. It's a, it's a small amount of calories over time that results in that fat gain. And then over five years, you've gained 30 pounds or whatever. So number one, um, even if that were true, and I'll tell you why in my observations, it's, it's not quite accurate. Even if it were only another you know eight calories per pound of muscle, that's still significant. You gain five pounds over a year, over two years, over three years. It does make a big difference, but there's something else here that uh, that's at play that we don't we haven't seen in studies yet, but we've definitely experienced as coaches and trainers. And if you talk to anybody with a lot of experience working with clients, I mean, I've trained clients and seen a 500, 600, 700 calorie swing, and they didn't gain 15, 20 pounds, 30 pounds of muscle. You know, they gained you know five or eight pounds of muscle. There's also an efficiency that happens with calories. Your body learns how to become more efficient with calories or less efficient with calories. We've seen this with studies on POWs. Uh, who get, you know, they get um, they get caught by by the enemy and they get you know almost starved to death, and their bodies will burn hundreds of calories a day. Yes, they lose a lot of muscle, but still, it's this incredible efficiency that that the body can uh, can can do with the same amount of muscle or the same amount of uh, uh, you know of, of lean body mass. It, the reverse is also true. If you're constantly telling your body to become efficient with calories, I need you to be an an, an endurance machine. I need you to be able to utilize calories as efficiently as possible because I run five miles a day or whatever the case may be. Your body will learn how to become very efficient with calories. Now, some of that comes from muscle loss, but some of it comes from other mechanisms that we don't quite uh, fully understand. I mean, the human metabolism is, is quite complex. The same is true in the opposite. In fact, if you take somebody and you just increase their calories uh, without gaining any muscle, their body will burn a little bit more calories. So there's also that that's happening. So when you're doing resistance training, you are telling your body literally, don't worry about calorie efficiency because the number one thing I need you to focus on is getting stronger. That's the thing I need you to focus on. Calorie efficiency isn't, it's, it's down the ladder. On top of that, with resistance training, what usually, and what I always recommend is to slowly over time, increase your calories, especially through the intake of protein. And you see much more of a metabolism boosting effect from this. So it's, we don't yet have studies explaining this phenomena, but we've all, uh, as coaches and trainers, seen it with our eyes. 
Um, but it, it's, a, it's a lot more than just black and white. One pound of muscle equals this many calories. Right. Yeah, I know you definitely see that like myself personally, when I when I put on more muscle, you definitely can eat a whole lot more and obviously lose more fat by, you know, by not having, you know, to cut such such huge amounts of calories out. Um, another question that we always get is, um, and you kind of touched on it, how do you avoid losing muscle when you're trying to lose weight? Now, most of my patients are not like bodybuilders, obviously, right. well, and neither were your clients, obviously, they're just ordinary everyday people. Yeah. But they're like, hey, you know, I want to cut my calories. I do want to start losing weight. How do I prevent muscle loss or or gain muscle while doing this? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, because what you don't want to do is lose weight but end up with the same or higher body fat percentage, which is right. which is that which is quite possible, right? If you lost ten pounds, but eight of it was muscle, you actually have a higher body fat percentage because it's a percentage of your body weight, right? That's what's important. It's not necessarily the total body fat, but rather percentage of your body weight. Sure, uh, sure. That is body fat. So that's a very, very good question. Um, to answer it uh, simply, you want to give your body a reason to have muscle. Okay. Uh, muscle serves a very important function in the body. And it's also a very expensive tissue. If your body doesn't think it needs muscle, it'll get rid of it in the name of becoming more calorie efficient very quickly. In fact, if you've ever broken a bone or had an injury, I mean, you put a cast on your arm for two weeks, in two weeks, you take that cast off and your arm is almost unrecognizable. That's how much muscle you'll lose. Go and lay in bed for a week. Don't even just don't get up for a week and you will lose a significant amount of muscle and strength just from one week of that. So the, to put it plainly, give your body a reason to have muscle. And the best way to do that is to challenge it uh, by trying to get it to become stronger. So when we look at studies that compare resistance training plus diet, versus other forms of exercise plus diet. What you find with resistance training is at worst, far less muscle loss, uh, and at best, sometimes muscle gain, um, usually no muscle loss uh, at all. So uh, if your body has a reason to keep the muscle, it'll do what it can to do so. Now, if you cut your calories too low, uh, you're, you know, there's, sure, there's sure. nothing your body can do, um, but it, it definitely is the best reason that your body will have to keep that muscle and strength. Good. So I have, I have some friends that are, or even patients that will come up and say, Hey, you know, I lost 120 pounds. I ran every day or biked every day and ate just salad and chicken, you know, really low calories. And they're happy. Obviously I'm happy for them. I don't want to discourage them. And I know that's not what they, they can't do that forever. You know, they're in their forties or fifties now and they, they did that. Congratulations, but you can't keep doing that. How do you ease them back off of that? Or what do you, what is your approach to getting them back to kind of something more normal? Yeah. So, okay. So that's a much more difficult conversation once they're in it, like once they've done it um, and now they've done this for six months, uh, it's a much more challenging conversation. Uh, I would have this conversation with people up front, right? People would hire me and say things like, I want to lose 30 pounds. Uh, I need to improve my, my health and my fitness. And as an early trainer, um, you know, when people would come to me with this motivated state of mind, uh, I thought it was great to capitalize on it. Okay. You're very motivated. How many days a week can you make it to the gym? And the person, of course, who just decided to hire me would say something like five days a week. All right, we're going to do five days a week. Here's your meal plan. This is going to be awesome. It never worked right long-term. It was a terrible approach. Everybody failed. Studies will show 80 to 90% of people who take that approach fail. And the main reason why people fail is because uh, they rely on uh, motivation. Uh, motivation is what keeps them going. Motivation is a state of mind and it comes and goes. And what you really want to do is you want to start out from a, 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 a point of building discipline, which is a skill, which you can do over time. You can build discipline. So what I would tell clients or potential clients when they'd come to me super motivated is I'd say, how many days a week would you like to exercise? And they'd say five. And I'd say, okay, well, how many days a week have you been exercising? Zero. It's okay. Let me ask you differently. How many days a week do you think you can exercise consistently forever? And I, I would always say forever because I think that puts perspective in their mind. And they'd say, oh, wow. Because so five days a week, you think you do that forever and never stop. And well, you know, maybe, maybe two days a week. And then I would say, all right, let me start you out one day a week. Let's do one day a week because that's more than you're doing now. Let's start with that. Let's do resistance training because uh, we're going to get some benefit with it even at one day a week. And then over time, uh, naturally, they would come to me after they developed that habit of once a week. They'd come to me and say something like, hey, I'd like to do another day a week or I'd like to do exercise on my own. And over time, they'd build that 
skill of discipline and be much more consistent. Now, if I'm talking to someone like you're saying, who's already gone down that path, then I would say, okay, here's what we need to do. What we want to do is slowly reverse you out of all this cardiovascular activity because your body's now adapted to all this calorie burn. If you suddenly stop, you're going to gain a lot of weight. So we want to slowly back you out of that, start introducing resistance training so that we can tell your body to speed up its metabolism, build some muscle and some strength. And then what I want to do with your diet is I want to do what's called a reverse diet. I want to slowly increase your calories uh, to try to feed the new muscle and strength that we build. And then we would do that over a period of three months, six months, eight months. And then when they get to a point where their caloric intake uh, is to them feeling very high. And I'll know this because the client will come to me and say, oh, I feel like I'm eating all the time. And I also have them at a point where they're exercising it realistically. So they're working out, you know, an amount of times a week that, that is pretty maintainable. If at that point they want to get leaner, that's a very easy place to start from. Because now you're, you know, consuming 2,500 calories a day and you're not gaining any weight. Well, now we can drop you down to 2,000 calories, which is probably higher than you were before doing what you were doing before. And we can shed some some body fat, but some but oftentimes I have to reverse out of that where they were slowly to get them to a more sustainable place. So you, you slowly back off the cardio and you yes. slowly start increasing calories back up. Correct, and introduce resistance training. Right, gotcha. So another question I get a lot because I coach a lot of kids. I mean, I've coached almost every sport. Um, a lot of times we bring the kids in. I have a home gym, and we resistance train. And we, we do agility and other stuff too. Like, you know, the best way to train for your sport is to do your sport. And, and But then it's, uh, you know, strength translates into almost everything. Um, so we do some strength training. So the, the biggest question is, is resistance training safe for kids? I know in the past they used to say, no, it's going to stunt their growth and whatnot. But studies have shown that that's not obviously true. So I know you've coached a lot of kids as well as the elderly. Yeah. Is it safe at every age? Yeah, the, the amount of weight that a child would have to lift to damage their growth plates to, to cause any stunting of growth is far, far beyond their capability. So you have to worry about them. You know, you'd have to have an eight year old squat 400 pounds to cause any, you know, issues with their, with their, with their growth. Right. So they're not, they're not strong enough to stunt their growth with uh, resistance training. Um, they have to be carefully monitored uh, just because they typically don't have the coordination that uh, it, in, in other words, they just need to train appropriately, but that's true for any form of exercise. Is it safe? It's incredibly safe uh, for children, especially when done uh, properly. The form of resistance training that I uh, love the most with children is body weight. Um, it really improves their proprioceptive ability and their, uh, their coordination. So I'll start them off with body weight squats, body weight pushups, um, you know, body rows, just so they have that body control before I hand them a dumbbell or a barbell. Good. And the same thing goes for the elderly. I mean, kind of, we kind of touched on that earlier. Um, oh, just... ab ab absolutely. Um, you know, I had a client um, uh, years ago. She was osteopenia. She was getting quite close to osteoporosis. She had done the hiking and biking to try to improve her bone mass. The doctor had her on a few medications to try to cause things. We saw she saw a little bit of a slowdown in the uh, loss of bone in her lower extremities, probably because that's what was it, what was involved with uh, biking and, and uh, you know, hiking and whatnot. She eventually hired me um, and through resistance training, um, I mean, her doctor, I actually would get on the phone with her doctor because he couldn't believe how quick uh, he saw a reversal. It makes sense though, right? Uh, bones, uh, muscles anchor at bone, stronger muscle creates stronger bone. It's, it sends a signal to strengthen bone um, just like it sends a signal to strengthen muscle. And when you get older population, this is a big deal. This is a very big deal. You get yeah, their so muscle strong, you get their bone strong. That really improves the quality of life. And cardio, actually, there, there has been one of the studies that I go over in my, one of my talks actually can reduce bone mineral density. Um, or excessive aerobic training can reduce bone mineral density, where obviously resistance um, does not. So let me give you an example of one of my average patients, and you tell me how you would deal with it. All right, you're Dr. Sal. All right. All right. So Dr. Sal, my average patient is like 50 to 65. They had heart conditions, obviously. That's why they're seeing me. They might have had a heart attack. They're diabetic, hypertensive. They're overweight, somewhere in the neighborhood of 240 up to maybe 320 pounds. Um, and they're, they're sedentary. I've cleared them for everything. You know, they're okay to go exercise, do whatever they need to do. Like, you know, they're physically fit enough to do whatever. I send them to Dr. Sal. What would your approach? What would you do with this uh, gentleman or this lady? 
Yeah, no, I'm glad you said you clear them because that's the first thing I would do is I would, right. I, I would get on the phone with the doctor. Are they okay to exercise? If it's a yes. Um, I start with an assessment always. Uh, just having someone exercise without assessing their movement patterns and potential muscle imbalances is a bad idea. So I would do posture first. That's one of the easiest things. Uh, and you can identify a few things with posture. Um, then I would have them do a rowing movement. So I'd look at the, uh, the you know, the, or do they have good scapular retraction, and depression, um, which is important for posture and other uh, exercises. I'd have them do a pushing movement, look at the shoulder function. Can they reach up overhead? Can they do a standing squat? Uh, how is everything moving there? Um, and then from there, I would move them to the appropriate exercises. Um, I would train them uh, probably less with less intensity than most people would expect. When you're taking somebody who's completely sedentary, it doesn't take much to elicit a, uh, an adaptation response with resistance training. Um, you, you, you know, to, to use a different example, you know, imagine if you lived in a basement for, you know, for, for 10, 15, 20 years, a little bit of sun is going to cause your skin to, to darken. You don't need much. In fact, if you go beyond that, you'll probably burn quite easily. Um, so the idea is to set the adaptation process in motion and not to, not to get the body to prioritize healing. Um, there's a, there's a, bit of a misconception that the healing process is the the building process that's the process by which you get stronger and get more fit the and it's it's easy to understand why we we, we think that's because it, it overlaps with adaptation but the truth is healing and then there's adaptation adaptation goes beyond uh healing if you over uh, apply intensity or volume or exercise your body's only concern is to heal and you'll never adapt. And so what will end up happening is we, I'm sure many listeners or viewers have experienced this. You exercise hard, you get real sore, you go back to the gym, you do it again, you get real sore, but you never improve. You never get stronger. Your fitness doesn't improve. You seem to be plateaued, but gosh, I sweat and get sore every single time. What you're doing is you're just, you're causing damage and healing, damage and healing. You're stuck in this in this recovery trap. Um, so appropriate training allows the body to adapt. And when you take someone like the client you just mentioned, it's not going to take much. I'm going to have them do, you know, uh, you know, maybe a few squats off of a bench. I might have them do some rows where we're trying to, you know, maybe with a cable. So they're sitting upright. We're trying to connect to some of those upper back muscles, maybe an overhead press with some light weight. If they can't extend their arms above their head, then I'll have them do it without any weight and just focus on that tension. We may do a few other exercises, um, and then they're and then they'll go home and come back and see me a few days later. Excellent. So the, the key is start them slow. Is it sounds like because, yes. like you said, it doesn't take a whole lot. You don't want to take somebody and just kill them in the gym and then have them never come back. No, uh, and it's easy to it's easy to to overestimate, you know, because. I'll take somebody who's sedentary, and sometimes if they're really motivated, oh no, no, I could do more. I could do a lot more. And it's better to err on the side of less than more. It's actually much harder to back out of overdoing it than it is to add a little. So then when they come back the next time they see me, how did you feel? Oh, I, I felt fine. I felt like it didn't even work out. Perfect. So we'll go up just a little bit harder. Or they'll come see me and say, oh, I was really sore. Okay, now let's back off a little bit because I think we might have done too much. So, so Dr. Sal, another question. Now, here's a, the opposite kind of patient. Um, She's a 175 pound female. She's five foot four, maybe. Um, she has been walking every day, two to three miles, which which is fine. And she's resistance trains at home. You know, gyms aren't really open. She has some dumbbells at home. She does a few things at home. She's eating 1,200 calories a day, and she feels like she's stuck. She lost like three, four pounds initially, um, but now she's kind of stuck. And she wants. She asked me. This is a real patient, actually. She asked me, should I go to 1050 or, or 1100? Obviously, you and I know that that's really, really low. But but what does building somebody's metabolism look like realistically? What would you tell her and, and what would you say? Like, how would you get her back into, you know, getting back on track? Yeah, so that's actually quite common. I would see clients uh, almost identical to what you, just, uh, what you just said. So what we would do, of course, I would do the assessment. So, I, uh, so let's just assume everything's appropriate. Um, I would focus on strength. We would do big gross motor movement, you know, compound lifts. So I'd have her deadlift, uh, squat, overhead press, bench press, row. Um, and the goal is to, to really build her strength. I would probably keep the reps 
between six to eight repetitions. Um, I would, of course, make sure that she was stable and tight and, and, and had good technique and good form. Then with her diet, I would take her, uh, first off, I'd identify uh, how many, cal how many uh, grams of protein she's eating a day. Um, is she eating, if she's 175 pounds, uh, let's say her lean body mass is 120, I'd probably want her to aim for right around that many grams of protein a day. High protein uh, diet, uh, it tends to build uh, more muscle in combination with resistance training than, than having a, a diet that's- And it burns normal. fat. It does. And it's, it's got some thermogenic effects and, and it's, you know, it's better for satiety and all that stuff. So I would make sure her protein intake is high. Then I would take her up to about 1300 calories. Um, and we could do that through either the increased protein or if she's already eating high protein, uh, we can increase carbs or fats depending on her preference. Doesn't really make a big difference. Um, and we would stay at 1300 calories for a week or two. Um, I'd look at her strength as she got stronger and she feels a little better then I'd bump again. And it would look like about 50 to 100 calories every other week or so. Now, if I see a big jump in the scale, and I'm going to expect a few pounds of increase on the scale. And I'll, right. I'll so make how do you how do you talk like she's going to say, Oh, my God, I'm 178 now. Yeah, I you got to I, I you know, you got to paint the whole picture. I'm gonna say, Look, you know, it, uh, here's the deal we have, a, we need a, we this is a long term approach, I need to get your metabolism to a, a sustainable place. Because so do you tell them it's going to be like a year? Yes, more? absolutely. I can okay. say, I, I'll, right absolutely. Front. I, and you know, here's the other thing too, is um, sometimes I tell people not even to have to, to weigh themselves because it can really mess with your head. In fact, you know, what's funny. Sometimes I'll get a client whose weight won't budge on the scale, but because they've burned some body fat and built some muscle, they feel smaller. Um, and, and that's great. So they'll say to me, I think I'm losing weight, you know, and in reality, they've just, you know, body fat takes up more space than muscle. So, sure. you know, you lose, you do a, a five pound transfer, you're smaller. Um, because muscle is so much more dense, but yeah, we slowly do that over time. Um, and what the signs that I'm looking for from this, from this client are increased appetite. That's a great sign. Um, all of a sudden, you know, they'll tell me, man, my appetite is ramped up recently. Oh, that's a good sign. That means you're, we're, we're, we're probably in the right, go moving in the right direction. Obviously strength. Are you much stronger? If I'm getting that person stronger on a relatively consistent basis, it's my favorite thing to see because I know we're, we're moving in the right uh, direction. How is their sleep? Are they sleeping well? Libido is another good one. Typically, a woman like that uh, who's exercising like that, eating only 1,200 calories, typically has a libido issues. Um, so they'll tell me my libido feels much healthier. My sleep feels much better. I try to point out things that, aren't, that don't have to do with weight because it could be hard, it could be hard to be patient, you know, to wait eight months or six months, eight months, or a year for the body to start burning body fat. So I try to highlight a few of the things like, how's your skin? How's your digestion? How's your energy? How's your libido? That way, at least they could see like, oh, you know, positive things are happening. And then once I get that, that client up to 2,000, 2,200 calories, uh, then we'll start to, to bring the calories down. And then the body fat just comes off the body. And then now they're losing weight at like 1,800 calories. Oh yeah. And they, and it, and it comes off much faster than before. And you have more room to go down if you need to, if they hit a plateau. Absolutely. 100%. You know, the, the goal is to get someone to a place that's maintainable and 1200 calories, 1100 calories a day, exercising five days a week is not maintainable unless you're a total fanatic, in which case you might even, you know, you might be unhealthy in that direction, right? Definitely. Um, so what is your philosophy on diet? I get this question a lot. They ask me, you know, Dr. Allen, what is your, what is your favorite diet? Do I, you know, I know you guys don't, you guys go for a balanced approach, eat things you yeah. like, something you can adhere to, but you're not into these restrictive uh, fad diets, but, but just give me an, like an overall view of what is your view on diet? Yeah. So, you know, I, I'm not going to be saying anything here that you don't already know, but you know, okay. So we can look at diet uh, from a mechanistic point of view, or we can look at it from a behavioral point of view. What we're dealing with with the average person is not a, a problem with them, uh, you know, trying to reduce their calories or hit the right macronutrients. Now, it is true that most people are unaware of how many calories are in particular meals. It's true that a lot of people are, are unaware of, you know, grams of proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. But that approach just doesn't work long term. And what I mean by that is just telling people to cut their calories, eat less, eat these particular macronutrients definitely doesn't work when we do a, an extreme diet where you tell people to cut out all carbohydrates or, you know, cut out all fat or, you know, whatever. 
by the way, those are just easy ways of cutting calories, right? So you go on those diets, you lose weight because you've reduced your calories. What you want to do is you want to work with people from a behavioral standpoint, because this is where we run into uh, most of our problems. Um, of course, the, the big issue is we tend to overeat. So what we want to do is we want to uh, try to avoid foods that cause us to overeat. Now, there's some individual variants there. Um, you know, we all have trigger foods. But by and large, for most people, heavily processed foods uh, are the most powerful. Um, they're, they're extremely effective at getting us to overeat. In fact, there's some really well done studies on this particular topic where they, it was actually, there were crossover studies, really good, where they took groups of people and they let them eat as much as they wanted. They actually monitored their caloric intake. One group had whole natural foods. So these are foods that don't come in wrappers, boxes, you know, those types of foods. The other group, it was all processed foods. And they actually made sure that the macro, you know, breakdowns of these foods were relatively similar. So it wasn't like one was high carb, one was low fat. Or, it was pretty similar. The only difference was heavily processed versus whole and natural. They had the meat as much as they wanted. The researchers tracked their calories. Then they crossed them over. So this group now went to the process. This group went to the uh, to the whole natural, and they did the same thing. And what they found was heavily processed foods, on average, increase your caloric intake by, by around 500 calories a day, which is massive. 500 calories a day is roughly a pound of body fat uh, you know, that you would gain in a week if you were to kind of you know, do the rough math or whatever. So that's insane. And it, it makes sense if you think about it. Heavily processed foods are engineered to make you overeat. They're actually, you know, most of the research and development that goes into these foods goes into making them as palatable as possible. Everything from the, the taste to the crunch, to the sound it makes, to the, the residue it leaves on your fingertips, the, the bag, the color of the bag. Like it's insane how many things that they, you know, how, how effective they are at engineering these foods. Just to give you an example, by the way, I love to use this example because it really paints the picture. If I gave you uh, four large plain baked potatoes, no salt, no butter. I, I boiled them. Okay. And I said, here, eat all four of these in 15 minutes. Uh, that would be rough. I mean, you'd probably gag after the second <laughs> potato, right? You would hit what's called palate fatigue, which is a natural uh, physiological phenomenon. Now, if I gave you a, a large family size bag of Lay's potato chips and I said, Hey, eat this in 15 minutes, you might actually be able to do it. Now, that lace bag of potato chips actually has more calories. Um, but the difference is, is it's hyper palatable, you know, fried and salted. And it, it's just, it just overcomes that signal of, uh, of satiety. You know, another example is when you're, 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 you eat a big dinner and you feel like you're stuffed and they bring out dessert and somehow you can fit more in your mouth. Right. Um, so heavily processed foods just make us eat more. So the single most effective step someone can do with diet uh, generally speaking, and of course there's always individual variants, but generally speaking is just avoid heavily processed food. You will naturally eat less. You will naturally eat in a way that's more appropriate for your body. Now, along those lines, there's other things that I focus on with clients. For example, um, uh, you know, uh, don't be distracted when you eat. Studies show that when you're on your phone or watching TV, you'll consume hundreds of more calories than if you're just sitting there eating, focusing on the food, uh, don't drink fluids when you're eating. Uh, it, it, it encourages you to chew your food thoroughly, which actually also makes a big difference. Um, try not to reach for food uh, when you're stressed, anxious, or sad. And if you, if you do have a tendency to do that, take your favorite comfort foods. Don't have them in the house, but give yourself permission to drive to the store and get them if you really want them. Um, that way you set a barrier between you and whatever that food is, which actually gives you time to pause and say, well, do I really want that pizza? Uh, maybe, maybe I'll just stay home instead or whatever. Those training behaviors is far more effective than just training diet. Uh, tra just training diet, you're, you're going to lose 80% of the time. Got it. So as a cardiologist, I, I have to ask you, I know you, 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 like to eat, you like to eat red meat. You say you do it every day. At least that's what you yeah. said on the podcast and saturated fat. I'll tell you my thoughts, but I want to hear your thoughts on that. What are your thoughts on red meat and saturated fat? You know, it's uh, if you are otherwise healthy, there's a, actually it seems to be a quite uh, interesting individual variance with saturated fat, uh, blood lipids, you know, cholesterol, 
um, you know, cardiovascular risk. Uh, it, it, there's a huge individual variance. For a lot of people who are healthy, um, who don't overconsume, that, that, that's, by the way, that's, that's, that context, we can't stress that enough. Um, even sugar, sugar in a diet that is not, uh, you know, high in calorie has way less of a negative effect than sugar in a, in a diet that's high calorie. The same is true for, you know, uh, saturated fats or other, you know, nutrients. So if you're, if you're not over consuming, you're otherwise healthy, you're, you're totally fine. Uh, for the most part, you're totally fine. Now there are those, uh, individuals with genetic variants where they'll come see you. And for whatever reason, they just, uh, you know, their, their cholesterol is insane and you might need to treat them with a, a statin or they might need to avoid certain foods. But, but by and large, uh, if you're otherwise healthy, avoiding heavily processed foods, um, you, if anything, you'll see your health improve by eating, um, you know, foods like red meat, which are incredibly nutrient dense. Yeah, exactly. So all the studies that they've done on, uh, saturated fat saturated fat is the main problem because that's what raises your uh ldl which is your bad cholesterol and it's highly correlated with heart attacks and strokes i mean there's just no question about it at this point but they found that if you correct for bmi and all the studies that they've done if you uh take saturated fat intake and correct for bmi the leaner you are or the the, the closer you are to your to a normal bmi the less likely uh, that the LDL will go up. So somebody who's lean, like, like yourself, or somebody who is you know, pretty close to their normal BMI, they can get away with eating uh, more saturated fat, whereas you take somebody who's obese, um, who's already pro-inflammatory. The biggest problem with heart disease, you know, stroke, heart attacks, you know, all that kind of stuff, peripheral heart disease, um, is inflammation, right? That's the main cause. You've got this pro-inflammatory state, all this stuff is traveling through your arteries, destroying them because of the high blood pressure, high blood sugar, you're destroying your organs from the inside out and the LDL and the cholesterol is just patching up like a plaster on the sidewalls of your arteries that you're destroying. Um, the, the biggest cause of inflammation is actually obesity. Uh, when somebody has obesity, especially visceral fat, but, but any, anybody who's overweight or especially obese, um, the, all their inflammatory markers are higher. Their IL-6 is higher, their CRP is higher, their cholesterol is higher, insulin resistance is worse. You know, all the markers, your uric acid, everything, are all extremely elevated. As soon as they, they lose weight, regardless of how they even achieve that weight loss, even if it's just eating Pop-Tarts, mm. um, as crazy as it sounds, but if weight is coming off, all that stuff goes down uh, and improves. So the, the weight loss in and of itself uh, improves that. And when they looked at saturated fat intake, obviously we don't need as much saturated fat as we used to, you know, many, many years ago. But at the current level, somewhere under 12 to 10 percent of total caloric intake. But uh, if, if you're eating saturated fat and you're quite lean, you can get away uh, with more of it. Now, if you're a smoker and obese and you're pro-inflammatory and all that, you really shouldn't do but that at all. Context matters a lot. I mean, I'll give you another example, right? Uh, protein. Uh, you know, high levels of protein can stimulate some of the same pathways that can uh, make cancer uh, or feed cancer cells, right? Does that mean that protein is pro-cancer? No. Uh, carbohydrates do the same thing when you have cancer, right? So context matters. If you're overeating, well, yeah, now a lot of things uh, can cause problems. If you're not overeating, not only do they not cause problems often, but oftentimes they can be quite healthy because we have to look at the other things that red meat provides. And when I'm talking about red meat, I'm talking about whole red meat. I'm not talking about, sure. uh, processors. <laughs> yeah. I'm not. And that's, you know, there, there's something else I think I'd like to touch on. We've been told for so many decades now that, uh, red meat is bad for us, that there's a bit of a self-selection bias there that people who tend to eat more red meat tend to be, tend to care less about their health anyway. So True. is it the other stuff that is causing the problems or is it just the red meat? I mean, if you eat more red meat, Nowadays, you're also more likely to smoke. You're also more likely to be sedentary. You're more likely to, eat, to drink soda and do those other things, well, mainly because we've, we've now and connected. They, they eat about 600 more calories than the other, and then someone who doesn't either. Right. So, uh, so you know, we got to control all those things. I mean, you know, like people who take multivitamins are healthier. Well, is it because of the vitamins or is it because people who take multivitamins tend to be more health conscious and do a lot of other healthy things? So that's, a, that's another thing that we want to pay attention to. But Context makes a big, uh, context is very very important. And again, let's look at the other things about red meat that are very important. Red meat is very high source of natural creatine. We know that creatine has got incredible health benefits, cognitive health benefits. It's good for mitochondrial health. In fact, you're, you're starting to see now uh, creatine being uh, you know given to people with you know uh, with dementia or people given uh, who are older because it's good for muscle and for strength. 
Uh, red meat is also one of the most nutrient dense foods you'll find uh, anywhere. It's extremely nutrient. In fact, not that I would recommend this, but you could get away with just eating red meat and you probably won't have a nutrient deficiency. You can't do that with any with almost any other food, especially any other non animal uh, you know based food. You'll, you'll you'll have some kind of nutrient deficiency. So it's very nutrient dense. So what ends up happening is you have health conscious people who, because of the whatever information that we've been telling people for so many decades, they avoid red meat because they think it's bad, even though they're lean, even though they exercise, and then they end up with you know nutrient deficiencies or or, or worse, they they don't eat any animal proteins at all, um, and end up with uh, you know for example, there's studies that show that giving vegans creatine actually reliably increases their cognitive performance, um, probably because they don't get creatine uh, in their diet. So the message needs to be told accurately. I'm, I'm glad you're one of the doctors that's that's telling people the right way. Yeah, I'm trying. Um, the other the other thing I'll add, and I, I'm sure you know this, but um, people with higher lean body mass, when they're in the ICU or they have a chronic illness or they're very, very sick, they actually do better and are more likely to get out of the ICU and be healthier and make it out of there. Um, there's been a ton of studies on that. Um, one of my patients, actually, I remember he was telling me he has lower back pain and he's thinking of getting a new mattress and every couple of years he gets a new mattress. So I told him, hey, have you ever thought of deadlifting? And he kind of laughed at me. He's like, you mean like what power lifters do? <laughs> so I said, yeah, just start deadlifting. It, it just start with almost nothing. Just go down and get up with nothing. Then use a bar, a dumbbell, or a can of soup, whatever. He starts doing it and he gets up to 135 and he's like, <laughs> he's like, he comes back a few months later. He's like, doc, my back is better. I don't need a new mattress anymore. He's like, I feel great. I don't know what it was, but something happened in my back uh, and I feel amazing. My wife says I don't snore anymore. I don't have back pain. I'm not going to change the mattress every two hours. He feels great. I mean, it's just little stories like this, and I'm sure you have thousands of them um, that just yeah, get you very excited. Yeah, you know, um, most chronic pain, because uh, you have acute pain, which is a you know, result of injury. I hurt myself. But most chronic pain, the kind that just, you know, I have a bad back, I have bad knees, I have hips that bother me, are the result of, of weakness, the result of inactivity and weakness. They're, it's not like it was, you know, 100 years ago, where if you have bad knees, it's because you're in the coal mine, or you're, you know, you're, you're, you're you know, you're in the fields or whatever. It's because you do nothing. Um, so strengthening your body, uh, in that case, is the remedy. I, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you what, so the, toward the, the last, I would say, Eight years of my career, I used to have a, a, a wellness studio. So we had personal training, massage therapy, nutrition, uh, and I had some, some Eastern uh, medicine practitioners. I had some acupuncture in there as well. My studio was down the street from a very big hospital uh, up here in the Bay Area. And I started to train uh, quite a bit of the, the doctors uh, there. I started, I trained one, then they referred another one. And before you know it, I had at one point, I think I was training 13 uh, doctors. Uh, you know, some of them were surgeons, some of them were anesthesiologists. But anyhow, uh, once they started to feel how their bodies felt, they were sending me patients left and right, uh, you know, cardiovascular patients, patients with back pain and shoulder pain. And, and they were always so blown away by the, by the results that their patients were getting. People who had hip pain for decades, all of a sudden hip pain, not only is the hip pain gone, but they could do walking lunges, you know? Um, it, it really, when you, when you apply it appropriately, it gets the body to move more effectively and efficiently. You build strength and stability and those joints are not stressed like they were before. Definitely. So another question, maybe one of the last ones, have you ever had any hardship in your life and how did you deal with it? Oh yeah, I've definitely had some hardship. Um, one thing that comes to mind was uh, I had someone very close to me who um, got diagnosed with uh, stomach cancer at the age of 56. It was actually uh, a, a form of stomach cancer that was quite rare and quite aggressive called uh, lenitis plastica. I think the, the five-year survival rate on that is almost zero. Um, so it was very, very hard uh, time watching her, you know, try to fight it and, you know, do the, the treatments. And I trained her. And during that period of time, I, you know, exercise and I, I communicate this to, to on the podcast quite a bit. You exercise should be there to to improve and supplement your life. And so in that period of my life, I was not working out to, you know, get stronger in the squat. I wasn't working out to get shredded or look whatever. 
I was in the gym maintaining my health so I could help her. Um, and so my workouts looked much, much different. It was much slower, much easier. It was stress relief. It was, let me keep myself healthy so I can help take care of that person. And then I would do other things as well. I, I, uh, prayer and meditation were, were big parts of, uh, you know, helping during that period of time. Yeah, exercise can definitely be very, very therapeutic. I know you guys sell a lot of exercise programs. What is it? What is a good beginner program? And I'll link it below, obviously. Which one of your programs, if somebody, assuming gyms are open, because here in Ohio they are, and I'm sure in most states they probably are. Um, if somebody wanted to start a program, what would you recommend? Uh, MAPS Starter is the best program. In fact, all you need to do MAPS Starter are a pair of dumbbells and a, a physio ball, big, uh, you know, one of those big Swiss balls. Um, we designed that specifically for somebody who's starting out with uh, resistance training. So uh, the goal of it initially is to improve stability, control, strength. By the end of MAP Starter, um, you should be ready to move towards a more uh, traditional form of resistance training. And uh, I'm assuming the next program would, like, I mean, I own almost all your programs. Uh, I think the next one would probably be anabolic, I'm assuming. Maps anabolic, and you would start in pre-phase. So that would be gotcha. a great transition, right? Map starter to pre-phase and maps anabolic, and then you can stay in pre-phase as long as you want. And when you feel like you're really, really good and comfortable with those exercises, you feel strong, then you can move to phase one and, and then continue. Awesome. Well, I appreciate having you on here. Uh, I know you guys are really busy. Um, tell everyone, and I'm, I'll link it below, obviously, tell everyone how they can find you, your, your book, your, your website, your podcast. I'm sure Doug will send me all that stuff too, but thank you. Yeah. So you, being on. you can find the book, um, on any, uh, any platform, any book platform, but if you want to, you can go to the resistance training revolution.com, um, and get it through our site. Uh, the podcast is mind pump. You can find that on any, any podcast platform. You can also watch it on YouTube, uh, under mind pump. Um, and then if you want to find me uh, individually, you can find me on Instagram at uh, Mind Pump Sal. All right. Well, thanks for being here. I appreciate it. And I'm sure my audience is really going to enjoy this one. You know, yeah. I never have any guests, by the way. So you're the first one. Oh, really? You're kidding me. Well, thanks for having I'm me serious. on. Really. Thank you very much. All right. Well, take care. Thank you, guys. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.